Thanks, Jason. I might just survey the audience first, if I can. Um, could everyone who's a sonographer put their hand up for me, please? Terrific. And people who aren't sonographers, pop their hand up. Medical staff talking. Excellent. Fantastic. Um, so thank you for that introduction. Um, I hope so you haven't seen too many of the slides here previously. Um, I've spoken a little bit before on imaging and varicose veins. So I thought I'd start first, so what is varicose vein surgery? Um, well, it's this third line old fashioned treatment where you have to have a general anaesthetic. You strip the vein out to the knee and leave half of it behind. You've got lots of scars, lots of bruising and three weeks in bed. So what's actually first line gold standard treatment now is thermal ablation. And that either consists of laser or radio frequency. And you can see happy patients, they walk in, walk out full length treatment from the ankle and uh, straight back to work. So why do we perform ultrasound after the old fashioned stripping? Well, you're 50 times more likely to get a deep vein thrombosis. So you might be doing a DVT scan um, and you might be identifying de novo DVT and people just walking around with varicose veins that are still there after they're stripping. The chance of getting a DVT is between four and nine times higher than normal if you have varicose veins. So this is really interesting. This often gets misdiagnosed as infection by GPs. And if sonographers particularly have to be on the lookout with this. Um, look at the patient with the lights on and, and look at where the red tender spots are. The reason I put both scans up here is you can see in the right leg, you've got classic distribution of varicose veins with the great and small saphenous being incompetent. And on the left, you can see they've got clot through the small saphenous and through the popliteal vein. So that's what happens is that they get superficial thrombophlebitis so in their, in their small saphenous, and then that tracks up into the popliteal vein. Because you always want to try and work out, is it the chicken or the egg? Did it start with a DVT or did it start with varicose veins? Because if you've got a blocked deep system, you can get secondary varicose veins. So this is just a slide looking at the chance of getting a DVT if you've got varicose veins. And so you can see it's between four and nearly nine times higher than normal, all with significant p-values. So just treating patients with CA4, 5 and 6, I think we probably should be treating patients uh, with lower grades of venous insufficiency because I think we're underestimating the true problem with thrombosis. So if you have a look at the costs of thromboembolism, this is an analysis done by Access Economics and looked at data from 2008. And you can see the expenses are enormous. So the health system expenditure is 148 million and then the non-health related costs 1.57 billion. So going back to the thrombophlebitis, it's often misdiagnosed by the doctor. And then when it is diagnosed correctly, it's not treated properly. So the patients need serial ultrasound to check for progression. They need your classic thrombophlebitis management, which is pyridoid, compression, non-steroidals. And then often they need anticoagulation if it's quite an extensive thrombus, even if it's not near the deep system. So other indications for ultrasound after stripping uh, groin complications, which are very high. You can see here, 8% uh, wound infection rate. Again, significant p-value. Other indications are surgical failure, which is 20%. Residual venous insufficiency, you'll see from inadequate primary surgery. You'll almost always see a residual great saphenous vein below the knee because we don't strip below the knee generally uh, because of the risk of nerve injury. Uh, the small saphenous vein, you'll see the whole trunk often because usually it's just ligated at the junction. You'll see duplicate systems, the anterior accessory, uh, which is often not treated with stripping. And then you'll see residual tributaries that have never been treated because they were not visible to the naked eye. They're only visible on ultrasound. And then obviously the junctional locations. And then you may have had an inadequate primary duplex prior to original surgery. So just to show you why we don't strip below the knee generally, the risk of nerve injury is 39%. So the other reason to do an ultrasound after stripping is to look for new venous insufficiency. So this is one of Jackie's scans and you can see it's quite challenging these patients. They've got quite messy legs. So going back to basics, what is venous disease? We've well, got your varicose veins and then you've got complications from your veins. So they either clot or they leak. So look at the patient with the lights on and standing and often on your worksheet, just sketch down where the visible veins are. These are all the different things you can see with venous disease. So 
Here you've got the thrombophlebitis. This gentleman has got lymphedema from his venous, secondary to his venous edema. So he's got deep venous insufficiency, also secondary to his superficial insufficiency. Venous eczema, uh, pigmentation, atrophy blanche and ulcers at a capillary le level, fibrin links out of the capillaries and coats like a cement wall and that's why you get oxygen deprivation to the tissues. <coughs> and then you've got some post-thrombotic limbs here and ulcers. Now, looking at uh, endovenous techniques, you're going to get a lot more challenging patients because really most people are suitable for endovenous techniques. So this man has Stills disease and every joint in his body is fused. He's actually been in paid work until about three years ago and he's in his 60s. Uh, this sort of patient, you know, they're, they're big patients, they've got heart failure often, they're anticoagulated, they've had DVT in the past, they're complex patients. So just looking at the room set up, you want to have an adjustable bed, you want to have a standing stool with a, um, a handle, um, a good machine, um, plenty of stationery, which we tried to get in the photo here, but you can see here, um, lots of towels, um, gowns and a blanket for patients. Tell them to be well fed and watered beforehand. Uh, no moisturiser on the legs in case the uh, gel doesn't stick very well and not to wear compression on the day of scanning. And take a history from the patient. They're really unhappy with you if you're squeezing their legs and they've got areas of pain and tenderness and you haven't asked them about it to start with. You want to know where the previous treatment's been and what is the patient's area of main concern. I'll, I'll have a patient who had a, a sore ankle and they had a thrombosed vein in their ankle, but because they didn't tell the sonographer, it wasn't looked at. So we sent them back to have another scan. So always ask the patient where their main problems, where they think their main problems are. Be methodical and don't change your scanning routine. You can get so lost in all the veins. So just try and be methodical. Patient standing on the step, handrail, leg externally rotated, weight off the leg. It's about 20, 30 minutes standing. And then below knee, you can do sitting. Always start with B mode, then color, then a Doppler waveform <coughs> analysis. And again, just to reiterate what we've already talked about, you can see this gentleman here, sorry, has had previous stripping, and this is the residual great saphenous vein. And then he's got lots of perforator incompetence and pigmentation in the ankle, in the gator region. If there's any evidence of thrombosis in the superficial or the deep systems, I then get the patient to have a formal DVT scan. And again, because you're trying to work out the chicken or the egg as well, and you want to make sure the deep system's not obstructed if you're going to close the superficial system. So I don't want to uh, go over too much of what Tim's already talked about, um, but it's pretty much the same, same things that he's mentioned already. Um, and this is a patient with recurrent disease and you can see you've got a few segments of great saphenous, you've got some incompetent small saphenous bilaterally, and then you've just got lots of tributaries. You do see a lot of neovascularization in the groin after stripping, which interestingly you don't tend to see after thermal ablation. So we need to know the length of the incompetent trunk veins, the diameters, um, the long straight veins, uh, the, sorry, the diameters of the long straight veins, the diameters of the junctions, and associated competent veins. So for instance, we might have incompetent above knee great saphenous or below knee great saphenous. And then you want to know whether you're going to treat the whole length of the vein or just the incompetent segments. And I used to just treat the incompetent segments, but if you find that the competent vein is actually much larger on one side than the other, then you can fairly predictive that that's going to become incompetent with time. So then I'll treat the whole length. So the diameters are really important. The junctions are important and the diameters because if they get an e-hit or proximal thrombus, you won't be able to still identify it apart from looking at diameters. So going back to modern vein care, these are just the UK guidelines, the NICE guidelines. These were produced in 2013 and updated in 2016. How am I going for time? No. <laughs> Sorry, where am I up You're to? in control. Good. But where am I up to? <laughs> ten? You, almost ten. Oh, good. Perfect. Um, so... These are evidence-based and they're basically to guide the public health system or the NHS. So you can see um, they've recommended, and this is in 2013, thermal ablation for people with confirmed varicose veins and trunk reflux, thermal ablation's first-line treatment. If that's not suitable, then do injections. 
And if that's not suitable, then do stripping. Very interestingly, down the bottom here, they said do not offer compression hosiery to treat varicose veins unless you can't do intervention. So in the days of just stripping as being an option, you'd say, well, if they're not suitable for stripping, you'll be okay, just wear compression. But now because thermal techniques are so much better than stripping and the risks are so much lower, you can't say that compression is comparable anymore. So going back to modern vein care. So first line treatment now in three international guidelines, thermal ablation. So just to give you a little bit of a diagram, where do we do the thermal ablation? So I divide the patient up into the visible tributaries, which are the green ones that we can do phlebectomy in. This is only required 5% of the time. You've got the trunk vein, which is for the thermal ablation. And then you've got the tributaries beneath the skin for the injection. So I don't inject visible tributaries. These are some new interesting treatments. Um, Clary vein's been around for a while. It's mechanical and, and chemical. Um, steam, and then you've got the glue as well. Just be wary of the glue. Um, I've seen two people present the same data, and one said they had an 80% success, and the other said they had 100% success. It was the same data with the same patients from the same hospital. And then I saw that data presented at Charing Cross in London earlier this year, and they changed their definition of success. So they said, so long as there is no segment more than five centimetres open, it's a success. So you could have 20 lots of five centimetres still open, and it's a success. So just be a bit wary of the glue. So uh, Tim's already gone through all of the veins that we can treat. It's quite nice because with stripping, you know, really, you're not pulling out the small saphenous or the Jacobin or thigh extension. You can do quite nice retrograde entry into a lot of these veins if you need to, coming from up high in the thigh. And often they'll track from the small saphenous up into, into the thigh extension anyway. So I started just doing knee to groin treatment because that was how I was trained to do stripping. I didn't want to damage the saphenous nerve. But then I found that um, because of the risk of thrombosis with ultrasound guided sclerotherapy, which we saw this morning, I got a lot of patients referred to me by Melbourne Hematology and they have high thrombosis risk. So I wanted to offer them laser treatment from the ankle up, which I was very nervous about for fear of nerve injury. But we did a prospective analysis and we found that only one patient out of a, sorry, one out of 170 veins had long-term um, numbness of a 50 cent coin size um, at the ankle and that was at 12 months. So they do get some numbness but it tends to go away. Again I used to just treat the incompetent segment but then when you see them four or five years later the rest of the vein becomes incompetent. So I tend to do ankle to groin or ankle to junction treatment for everyone. It's actually a really nice entry point down at the ankle because the vein's really big. <laughs> it's easy to get into. So post laser scan, we confirm closure, we do a clot scan, we do an incompetent scan, and we do a mapping scan. Now the reason we do all of these is because I only treat the trunk veins with the primary sitting. So we want to exclude an E hit, and I'll talk about that uh, down the track, but what's important, basically that's thrombus in the proximal untreated segment of the trunk vein. And you've really just got to look at the diameter of the proximal veins. So you've got to have good before and after diameters. And if it's bigger, then you've got to think, well, this could be thrombus, not lasered vein looking at the diameter of the junction. You want to make sure the epigastric veins are patent because if there is proximal thrombus but those veins are patent, it doesn't tend to progress to any problems. You want to know about spontaneous tributary thrombosis because that's a red flag for me that the patient's prothrombotic. And so that will then help me uh, determine whether they need plexane or anticoagulation for their injections. And then the DVT rate is extremely low. So this is the original cabinet classification of endothermal heat-induced thrombosis and basically in the proximal untreated segment of vein, if you've got thrombus extending up to the junction, it's a one. If it's going through the junction, but not more than 50%, it's a two. And if it's more than 50%, it's a three. So you can see here, this is where this patient had laser performed. Uh, so then we do a venous insufficiency scan. Now, the reason I started staging the procedures is that we found a lot of the tributaries would go back to normal without treatment. So then they need less injections. And injections are a high risk treatment and not as successful, so if you can minimise the injections, it's better. Don't be surprised to see reversal of deep venous insufficiency um, in patients who had it pre-treatment, and this patient's just had laser, no other treatment, and a lot of the deep insufficiency has gone back to normal. So this is a technique that I coined, called, uh, named after a patient, Gianluigi, called the GLOW technique. We do quite extensive mapping of where the perforators are, the veins we don't want to inject and the veins we do want to inject when we do ultrasound guided sclerotherapy. I was quite concerned about the uh, literature saying that two or three percent of people get symptoms with ultrasound guided sclerotherapy such as chest pain, 
coughing, chest tightness, visual disturbance. And to me, that's embolic until proven otherwise. I don't think it's biochemical. And we actually don't see it at all in our patients. We're doing a prospective documented study for that now. So I think this technique should be used widely. So basically, we have two nursing staff who push on those drainage points uh, while the doctor's injecting. And then we visualise where the foam is travelling. And if we, because often you don't see a perforator until there's foam going into it. You don't see it on the diagnostic or the pre-mapping scan. So we're always checking, and then we have extra fingers ready to push on those drainage points. I want to caution people who are injecting the small saphenous vein um, near the serial nerve. If you're worried about thermal ablation damaging the serial nerve, you've got to be really careful with this saphenous artery. So this is a patient of mine. It's the only um, skin sort of major change that I've ever had after ultrasound guided sclerotherapy in seven years. And I tell you, I had a few restless nights after this, but they, she ended up quite fine. Um, but there is a saphenous artery that lies between about three and six o'clock in patients in the saphenous sheath or the saphenous eye. So it often has uh, some major perforating branches um, and one down near the lateral malleolus. Just be careful when you're looking at perforators, mark out where they're or identify arteries that might be nearby and check before you inject. So the other reason to do an ultrasound is after ultrasound guided sclerotherapy therapy is just to see if you had had success or failure. We always do two sessions of sclerotherapy uh, because I think the success rate is only about 80% with one, um, and we're hopeful it's about 95% with two. But uh, using ethoxysclerol, it's not a sledgehammer; it's it's just a hammer for treating veins, uh, which we use because it has a low anaphylaxis risk. The other reason we do scans after UGS is to investigate pain and swelling. Um, interestingly, these medial gastrocnemial veins we're seeing a few of at the moment, and I'm just looking into whether that's a technique issue. Um, we used to have one about every two or three years, um, and we've got other doctors in the practice doing injections at the moment. We're just training people up with different techniques, and I think you've got to be very careful with the volumes that you inject. And Kirosh Pazi's done some lovely work looking at um, you should be just injecting multiple small volumes because if you keep the sclerosin in high concentration, it acts as a blood thinner. But if it dilutes out, it acts as a procoagulant. So you can see this patient here has a thrombosed perforator, um, and that's given them a gastrocnemial vein DVT. These patients are usually put on some low dose uh, Clexane, or if they're traveling, I'll put them on a Pixaban. Um, I know that they usually don't extend to anything, but I think uh, what we do know is that if you anticoagulate them, they've got a lower risk of getting a recurrent DVT. Um, investigate superficial pain and redness, so up in here, and that's just superficial thrombophlebitis. And then lastly, um, ambulatory phlebectomy, which again I rarely perform now because once you've done the laser and you've done the thermal ablation, all of those bulging veins, so you can see here we've injected either side, so it either reduces down so it's not visible and then you can inject that or often it becomes competent or has no flow, and if it's still bulging then we pull it out. We just do that under local anaesthetic in the rooms. So it's really a minor procedure by then, and so you'd rarely have any indication to do any ultrasound after that. And then don't forget to talk to your patients about prevention. <laughs> Always emphasising trying to maintain a normal weight. Don't spend long periods standing or sitting, and wear your compression. So many patients tell me that they, I never told them to wear their compression long term for prevention, and I tell everyone at their first consultation, but no one wants to hear it. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Um, whilst um, <coughs> I think again we've got a few minutes for questions. Yes. Um, whilst people are gathering their thoughts, I, I might ask. Um, I saw on some of those post uh, endovenous treatment scans that you were scanning at uh, day one and day four. Mm. Um, I, I might ask Tim's opinion on those early scans and the, um, what what his. Uh, because you mentioned that you only do one scan after um, endovenous treatment, um, and uh, um, and uh, I think Karosh uh, is here as well, so he might comment on his work. But um, that that e hit the the early um, heat induced thrombosis. Um, I mean, presumably you're doing those early scans to look for that. Uh, yeah, how, we used how, to do one week. Concerned? Do we really need to be? We used to do one week scan. Um, and I think if you're going to form a clot, you're going to do it pretty quickly. It's going to be in 24 hours, is my impression from my experience. Um, we wanted to try and bring patients' treatment together into one week rather than spreading it out. 
Um, and so to do that, we brought the ultrasounds forward. Um, so we do the, the laser one day, we'll, we'll usually do the scan the day after or two days after, and then they'll have two days of injections and then they're done. Um, so I think most e-hits we were all concerned about early on, but I think majority have found, there's even word in the literature now that we shouldn't be scanning at all, that it's really not of any major concern, it has no benefit, no great benefit, and that it's a waste of the healthcare dollar. So I've seen literature to that effect as well. I feel more comfortable doing it, and I've got to do it anyway to check the incompetence and to do a mapping scan, so. So, so when is your next scan after that first couple of days? Uh, we do one at one to three months, and then we do an annual scan. Okay. And the one to three months is to check that the UGS has worked. I've become a minimalist, even um, in my crisis practice, I realised, I, I thought scanning too early was counterproductive because it tempted you to treat things that subsequently resolve. So, so I've become a deferrer and a minimalist because I think my view is, I used to do quite a lot of sclero and now I've backed right away from doing sclero because if you wait long enough, most of the varicosities will diminish in size and the patients are happy. So eight weeks, I have compromise of one scan of eight weeks. I'm not at all concerned about um, uh, proximal thrombosis. We've had one PE, and now I've been doing it for 10 years, and that was at eight weeks out from, from the knee. So, so I think scan infrequently and scan late is my experience. And um, perhaps along that line, um, uh, as you mentioned, you, you do some uh, ultrasound uh, some post uh, ablation sclerotherapy and yeah. rarely do phlebectomies, um, and this is um, in a private or public sector. Private, um, uh, and that's a slightly different population to what you're mentioning, Tim. Um, what What's your approach to uh, phlebectomies and uh, and post ablation well, sclerotherapy? In the private sector, the, the cosmesis is obviously uh, an important aspect, and it does alter how you manage patients because they're wanting. A much more complete result and ambulatory phlebectomy was part of my I, I preferred that sclerotherapy I've had a lot of problems with sclerotherapy with patients getting painful from a phlebitis and pigmentation and mm -hmm. you don't make friends with pigmentation so phlebectomy is, as you as we've heard is a very useful local anaesthetic minimally invasive way of taking the pain the pains out in a public hospital patients they're not concerned about appearance they're more concerned about edema, skin change, pain, and so forth. So, because and we make it clear to them, cosmesis is not the end point. So, it does change very much. So, what where you're aiming at, but um, again, I think the important thing is that you've got. To, I think you've got to wait quite a while before you offer secondary treatment. I certainly wouldn't recommend um, sclerotomy at the time of laser, and I think that the Ambulatory phlebectomy, as we elegantly showed, is a very good thing to consider um, at eight weeks with the dog. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Might move on. Yeah. Yeah.